Okay. Um, so yeah, so today uh, I want to talk about uh, containers for HPC. You heard a little bit about containers uh, for micro or for for web services yesterday uh, in the spin talk. Um, so this will be more focused on HPC uh, workloads. So uh, the, an outline of this talk uh, is uh, first I'm going to give a very brief introduction to containers. So this is is not uh, really going to be sufficient for a uh, uh, getting started with containers 101, um, but the goal is if you if you're not familiar with uh, containerized workloads, uh, this should give you enough context uh, to follow the rest of the talk, hopefully. Uh, and we'll also have uh, quite a few other materials. We have a lot of good training material uh, for folks to get started with containers, so we will share that. Uh, but this talk is a, a little bit beyond the scope of that. Um, then I'll talk about Shifter, which is our current container solution here that we that we use at NERSC. And then finally, uh, I'll talk about some of the work we've been doing to transition uh, to Podman and what the future has in store. Okay. So, uh, just to you know, kind of set the set the foundation here. You know, what is a container? I think probably most people uh, here today have heard of containers, um, but there's there's a lot of you know varying descriptions of of what they are and what they're used for. So. You know, a common comparison that's often made is a container to a virtual machine, and they're very similar in their purpose, which is to provide encapsulation around a software application and its runtime environment. That's kind of where the comparison stops because the implementation of containers and virtual machines is quite different. Um, so, you know, when you think of like how a virtual machine works, it's really, you know, sort of simulating the whole computer, right? It, it's got virtualized hardware. Uh, and the whole operating system, and and then all the the software uh, runtime, you know, inside that. Containers, by by contrast, are sharing uh, a Linux kernel with the host, and so they don't need to do all that additional hardware virtualization. So comparatively, they're they're much lighter weight than a virtual machine. Uh, it's also to note that even though you know the concept of containerization in this sense is not. Uh, could be implemented you know in different systems in 2022 when we talk about containers we're really talking about linux containers uh the implementation relies on features of the linux kernel so this is a, an inherently linux based technology okay and there's a little you can kind of see a diagram here uh, you know you could obviously stretch these boxes to make them different sizes but the point here you know is on the right the virtual machine has to simulate the whole guest operating system on top of a hypervisor while the container uh the, the sort of size of the encapsulated software is, is smaller, and so it's a lighter weight uh, object. So, you know, why, you know, if, if you've been following following the trend, containers have become very popular in the last uh, maybe 10 years or so. And, and why is that? Why, why are they so ubiquitous these days? Um, you know, so the idea of encapsulating your software with its runtime environment has a lot of benefits, right? So the, the, the words that are thrown around a lot are portability, scalability, reproducibility. And you know, if we if we look at those things, it, it just makes sense that if you if you make sure to you know bundle your whole runtime environment with your software, it becomes a lot easier to move it around between machines. It becomes a lot easier to uh, make you know duplicates of it so you can scale up you know as as you have more demand on your application or you can easily change the the underlying resources given to your application. It improves your reproducibility uh, because you have a a static file which uh, describes, you know, your uh, your workloads, your application, uh, and so if you need to if you need to redeploy it, you can redeploy it from the same from the same image. And there's also a general switch uh, from uh, imperative to declarative uh, deployment paradigm that comes along with containers, and that is an additional improvement to uh, to reproducibility. Um, and what that means, if you haven't heard that, you know, an imperative paradigm is uh, giving a list of instructions, whereas a declarative paradigm is saying, this is the result I want at the end. So when you look at deployment via Kubernetes uh, and other you know, technologies in the container uh, environment, they work that way. And so the system has a, a chance to say, oh, we didn't get to the goal that you declare that you wanted, so I can try to correct for that. As opposed to if you give a list of instructions and something goes wrong in the middle, you don't necessarily know what went wrong uh, or you know how to back that out and, and fix it. 
So all of this together becomes the building blocks of a of a, a modern scalable web architecture. And so you know, people, this is how you build applications if you want to have millions of users on a on a web service. Um, so that that's why they're that's why they're popular and that's why they're valuable. So what about HPC, right? Like we're not building web services for millions of users, um, but we still care about portability, about reproducibility, and about scalability. And so the use cases in HPC differ slightly, but this concept of, of software encapsulation is still very valuable and very powerful. So just some, these are just some use cases that, um, that you know, users benefit from today using containers on HPC. Um, so one case is if you have a complicated piece of software that is hard for users to build, you can build it once, and then you can share a container that can be used by many collaborators. Uh, another one is if you know if nurse staff keep changing packages, you know, on, on the HPC, we we try not to do that, but sometimes packages change. You can isolate uh, your software from those changes by by packaging your runtime environment in a container. Uh, you could potentially make your your research more reproducible by by saving that your runtime environment. Um, you know, about ten years ago, it was becoming quite common uh, that for you know code that, that you had to to publish uh, your your source code when you when you have results from a from a simulation. Um, and you know, publishing a container or making a container availability uh, available uh, when you publish scientific results is really just a step beyond that. You're not just saying this is the source code that code I use, but also Here's the compiled application I used. Here's the the libraries that it called. Uh, you can also uh, a really really common use case in NERSC today is avoiding metadata contention. So, for example, if you're calling Python uh, from a, a data and uh, you know analytic workload, and you have several nodes all trying to talk to the same Python libraries at once, you know on a shared file system that can that can create a lot of slowdown. But instead, you can pop that Python environment in a container. You can easily distribute it out to your to all your workers, and uh, all of the, all of those problems go away. Um, and then, you know, finally, you know, you, this potentially gives you some portability to move between supercomputers. Uh, and finally, you know, scientists also like web applications and have use for things like data portals and workflow management and things like that. So I'm going to take a, a brief kind of pause because there's a lot of vocabulary, some of which I've already been uh, throwing around. Um, so this is kind of a reference to that that you can go back to uh, if, if you if you look at these slides. And uh, so so I've said the word container many times already, right, in this talk. Um, and so the, the kind of the building blocks here is, you know, we have what we call an image, which is uh, the actual file that saves your software application in its runtime environment. That's a static object. It doesn't get changed. You know, or updated at any time. The container itself is a running instance of that image, and typically it will have like an ephemeral file system on top. So that means that I can run my container, I can go inside, I can make changes, and then when I shut it down, all those changes go away. They're not saved into the image file. The image is totally static. Uh, you need something called a container runtime, which is software that's responsible from creating containers, you know, from images. That's really important uh, here, but usually you don't interface with a container runtime directly. What you do is you use a container en engine, or sometimes it might be called a container framework, which bundles together a runtime and typically some other useful tools like um, an image builder and you know potentially other things to to manipulate uh, and uh, running containers and and uh, images. Uh, so speaking of you know, images, where do you get an image from? Um, if, you, if you want to build an image, you have to have a specification which, which describes what goes into that image. That specification is called a Docker file or a container file. It's really just a, a human readable list of instructions uh, for how to compose that image. And then once you've built an image, you also don't want to just kind of leave your images scattered all over. So you typically would save them to, you know, some cloud connected image registry. Uh, cloud or you know network connected uh, storage, uh, and that gives you kind of a, a source of truth where you can then you know retrieve your your images um, you know from many different places that you might be using them. Uh, finally, you know we'll talk a little bit about mounting. So I said that the container is ephemeral, um, but it's also very useful to have a way to get stateful information into a container. So you know how do you get a data set into a container? How do you get a configuration file into a container? 
Um, and so you can volume mount or bind mount um, persistent files or directories into a container uh, when you launch it. Okay. And there's also a bunch of technology names. I'm not gonna go through this whole list, um, but you've probably heard of some of these things. Uh, what I'll focus on, you know, probably if you've heard of containers, you've heard of Docker. Docker, Docker is a very popular container engine. Uh, Podman is also, uh, which I'll be talking about more today, is also a, a popular container engine. Shifter and Singularity are HPC specific container engines. Um, skipping ahead a little bit, another point that a lot of people get conflated on, you know, is, you know, Docker, what is Docker desktop versus Docker, you know, and, and Rancher desktop is another equivalent. Um, you know, I said containers are a Linux specific technology. So if you're running a, you know, a Mac OS or a Windows laptop, you actually need a Linux system to, you know, build and use containers. So what these tools, these desktop tools are, is really a, a way to run a Linux VM and manage it for you. Um, so that's a really good place to start uh, if you're if you're just trying to get started on your laptop using containers is to look up Docker Desktop or Rancher Desktop. And finally, kind of the the other big elephant in the room is Kubernetes. Um, so once you start, you know, working with containers, and you want to start launching a lot of them or launching different containers that work together, Kubernetes becomes really important to to manage. You know how you're deploying, scaling up, scaling down, track all the containers that you have running. Um, so it's a standard for the orchestration of containers. And then there are many, 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 many implementations. You'll see this list at the bottom uh, of Kubernetes. So like, you know, every infrastructure is a service provider. You know, basically any company that can conceive of a way to sell you a Kubernetes distribution has a Kubernetes distribution. There are Kubernetes distributions to run on, on your laptop, to run on the Internet of Things. You know, any, any device you can think of running Kubernetes, there's probably a Kubernetes distribution that, out there for it. Um, so this is just a short list of, you know, a few that, that I'm aware of, um, but there are many more. Okay, so that was a big push, a lot of information. You know, what does this look like if you have your, your you know, kind of feet on the ground? What are you actually doing to do kind of a minimal container workflow? Uh, you know, so here's some steps that this isn't the most minimal, but a very minimal workflow of what you need to do to get started uh, running an application in a container. So you can kind of think of the three steps here are, you know, you build, you build your image file, you, uh, you ship it or save it somewhere, like publish that image, and then you can run it somewhere else. Um, so in this case, you know, if you're assuming, I'm not going to go into the details of what's in the Docker file here, but if you have a valid Docker file that you edit, then you can just pass that into a Docker build command. And what this is saying is build you know, an image tagged with the name my image and look in this, this current directory for the Docker file and, and use that as my, my build context. Um, after I build that, then I can push that up to somewhere. In this case, with Docker, the syntax means I'm pushing it to Docker Hub. <clears throat> and then if I say, you know, I could want to, maybe I want to run this on my laptop. But in this case, I'm saying, well, I want to run it somewhere else. I want to run it on my workstation. So I can go over to my workstation. I can retrieve that image from Docker Hub by doing Docker pull, pull down that image, and then I can just run it, okay, Docker run. So it's very simple at the end of the day. Um, there's obviously a lot wrapped up here in you know, what goes into a Docker file, um, but this is very, there are many, many examples and tutorials um, on this. So uh, I, I'm going to gloss over that for the moment, um, but this is kind of the simple workflow. So what does this look like if we go to HPC, right? So naively, if I look at this, I would say, okay, I can build my image in the same way on my laptop, and I can still push it up to Docker Hub, and that's fine. And then maybe, you know, I want to run this on Perlmutter. <clears throat> uh, so, and I see your question, Alfred. So I'm about to answer this. Um, so, you know, naively, I can just I can just pull it right, and then maybe, okay, well, you know, I've got a batch system here, so maybe I need to allocate myself a compute node, and then I'll just, you know, put my Docker run behind an S run so I can launch it on many tasks. Right? This seems like it should work, right? But it won't work. Don't do this. Okay. So <clears throat> it won't work because no, uh, you know, Docker does have some kind of security concerns on a multi user system. So we don't allow users to use it. But even if we did, uh, it would still be a terrible idea. Okay. So, you know, Docker doesn't know anything about kind of how you want your HPC, your, your tasks to communicate. It doesn't do anything to kind of like optimize performance for HPC. So just don't, don't do this. Okay. So 
hopefully this this slide is clear. <clears throat> so, you know, we need to be a little bit more a little bit more clever. I think, you know, if we if we want to use containers on HPC, we need to think about, you know, what's unique about the HPC system and what what do we need to do here? So, these are some considerations that, you know, I think about when we want to run a containerized application. We know that HPC applications might be sensitive to file system performance. Okay, so so that's a that's a consideration when we have this virtualized kind of layered image that we're mounting. Uh, we know that they can be sensitive to communication uh, <clears throat> time, right? They can be very communication intensive. Um, typically, containers use like a virtualized networking layer, so we have to be concerned about that. Um, in a multi-user HPC system, it's not a trusted environment, right? And we have a lot of users, so that's the issue brought up in the chat, right? That you know, Docker typically runs your container with an agent that runs as root. So, you know, how do we deal with that? Uh, you know, and then how can we access, does that mean now if I if I have a container and I'm bringing my software runtime environment that I need to be building all of the like optimized HPC libraries myself all the time? That sounds like, that sounds difficult. Is there a way that I can get around that? <clears throat> Uh, and then finally, like, right, so I have a batch scheduler. So how do I make sure that when the batch scheduler is allocating resources and my container is deciding to spin up processes, that those things are kind of synced up and doing, you know, interacting well together and not kind of getting each other's way. So those are kind of, that's the broad strokes of what I would say are issues for, for using containers on HPC. Okay, so that brings us to, you know, why we want to use a, uh, a customized, uh, you know, container engine um, for you know for HPC, right? And so the state of affairs today is uh, Shifter is is a container engine that's available uh, at NERSC. Um, it's been available. It's been the container engine of choice at NERSC since it was introduced in 2015. Um, it's increasingly popular even through 2022 with uh, over 700 unique users in the first half of 2022. And the the super short version of what Shifter does is that it addresses those problems that I just raised. Um, so, so that you can have a performative uh, performative containers running on HPC. So <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit. So these are the problems that, or the, the, the things that I said we should consider here on the left. <clears throat> and I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you know, what does Shifter do to address these problems? You know, I said, so we're worried about sensitivity to file system performance. Okay, so we do some special squashing, you know, we, we do some management of the image ahead of time to make it a single layer read-only image. <clears throat> this still takes a Docker image, um, but it makes it a format that can be accessed, you know, efficiently. This happens uh, kind of invisibly to the user when a user pulls an image uh, onto Cori or Promutter, it's automatically like squashed into this efficient, into this efficient image. <clears throat> In terms of communication intensive, applications, uh, you know, we can just have the container opt out of any virtualized networking and just, you know, pass through the host networking. So we get all the advantages of like high performance HPC network uh, when we're using Shifter. <clears throat> so as far as security in a multi-user environment, we're kind of out of luck with Docker still. Um, Shifter requires containers to run as non-root. So you have to, uh, you can't, you can't have a, the main, your main user inside your container be root and your container doesn't get any special root capabilities. Um, so that, that solves that issue. Every, all the containers are just running uh, with user permissions. Uh, as far as including optimized HPC libraries, we have some fancy tricks with Shifter. You can add flags like this that say, for example, module GPU. And in fact, some of these are turned on by default. And what they'll do is hook you know, system libraries uh, like mpitch or like, you know, kudo libraries uh, into your container so your application can see them without you having to actually explicitly put them in. And finally, batch scheduler interaction. So there are some tricks with, with Shifter as well, where you can, if you see here, if I, if I want to, you know, make this, this S alloc line here is to create a, an interactive allocation with Slurm. And I can actually specify my image at that time before I even mention Shifter. And this will do some do some work to to preload my image and pass it out to all the nodes that that Slurm allocates to me, and then I can run Shifter here without even specifying an image, 
and it just gets that information directly from Slurm. So there's just some, you know, these are just some kind of uh, tricks in, in Shifter's design to, you know, make this process more, more streamlined. Um, so this is a really rapid kind of overview of these features. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to share some more resources in a moment. Um, but where does this lead us in terms of our workflow? Okay. So if we come back here, well, again, we can still build uh, an image with Docker on our laptop. And in fact, we, we need to, because Shifter isn't really considering that. It's really just considering this runtime problem down here. So we still build, build a, an image with Docker or you know, another container solution uh, on our laptop. We still push it up to some registry here like Docker Hub. But now we can, we can pull it onto our, our HPC system uh, using Shifter. So in this case, we have a, a, we have a Shifter image is the, the pulling binary. This will automatically do that step where I'm compressing my image. I can now allocate a, a compute node and then I can run this. So this actually looks very similar to what I had before where I just pull the image and then I can do you know, a container run just with this step of, of allocating some, some HPC resources in between. Okay, so I'm gonna take a pause here. So I know that was quite, quite fast uh, since I'm not spending a lot of time on Shifter today. Uh, that looks like I'm, oh, I started a little late. So I think I have a, a couple extra minutes. Um, but so I just wanna point out these resources. So there are slides uh, on, on the GitHub and there's a lot of good links in here. There was a, a really good talk. Uh, so if you're really just starting with containers today, really recommend you, you start on your laptop, look into Docker or Podman. And there are a lot of really good tutorials just out in the internet uh, for doing that. Uh, if, you, if you're interested particularly in Shifter, there was a, a, a good talk given uh, about a month ago by Laurie Steffi uh, that's specifically on how to get started with Shifter. And we also have a beginner tutorial and, and lots of good documentation on our, our documentation website. So, and if you get stuck, please, you know, we have a lot of container enthusiasts kind of behind the help desk, right? So, um, you know, please file a ticket and um, I'm sure you'll be met with, with an enthusiastic response um, if, if, you, if you have questions about containers. Okay. So I went through this really quickly, you know, so, so why not just stick with Shifter, right? I said, okay, we have, we have a, a way to performatively run containers on Perlmutter, on Quarry, and, you know, so what, what is motivating us to, to look into something like Podman, right? Well, you know, if, if we go back to our picture, you notice that, you know, Shifter really just addresses the runtime challenges. And so it's not really an end-to-end, -end, you know, container engine solution. Um, <clears throat> the, if you look at, you know, the requirements for uh, the, the security solution, which is to, to not allow containers to run as root, a lot of you know off-the-shelf containers that you can get, um, you know, prepackaged from companies or something like that. They are quite uh, they're, they're often run as root. Okay, so that, that like having that requirement disallows using a lot of kind of free containers that you could use. And and then finally, you know, we maintain Shifter. Shifter is a tool that was developed at NERSC and it's maintained in house at NERSC, so it doesn't have a lot of users and it doesn't have a big development team. And so trying to address these problems with you know, a lot of engineering is, is challenging in terms of just manpower. Um, so we'd really like to, to move to a model that has more um, a larger community and, and has more support in that sense. And, and from a user perspective, it also gives them another tool that they need to use uh, to learn, so which, is a, which is obviously a burden for the user. So we'd like to address those issues, okay? So that, that's kind of what motivates looking into uh, Podman. So I'll talk a bit about Podman and what it is. It's a uh, open container initiative compliant container framework, and it's under active development by uh, Red Hat. Um, it's quite it's quite popular. It's free and open source. It's widely used by an active community. So you can go to the GitHub and see how many how many people have pulled it. Uh, and I think it's tens of thousands now. Um, <clears throat> it also out of the box it provides a full featured rootless container environment. So what that means is uh, it can run, uh, it, can, it can launch a container uh, rootlessly with just user permissions, but that container can still be root, root inside. And so it's mapping like the root uh, user ID to uh, a not user ID 
uh, in the in the host. Okay, so that's a lot more sophisticated than what Shifter is doing, but it means that now we can run containers that you know as with root inside without needing special permissions. So this addresses a lot of the security concerns immediately out of box. So it's very powerful, uh, a, a very big uh, point in the favor of a Podman. It and, also um, provides. We, an hit, we hit eleven now, so yeah, you, you have a few more minutes. But... Yeah, I'm. I'm. I only have a, a few more. So, um, so it also provides an image builder. Um, so that kind of gives it an end-to-end -end solution. Um, it shares the command line syntax with Docker, uh, so that it's a kind of a good um, that people can kind of come into the, into it with a lot of uh, experience. And so the question is, can we address you know the performance issue here? Um, so I'll go through these, um, you know, basically the, the question, can we, can we address the performance issue is yes. Okay. So we did a lot of work to do that. Um, and basically all of those features, all that experience of what shifter does, um, we were able to do as well with configuration to Podman. So I'm not going to talk about the details of this because they're very similar to what shifter does. Um, but basically we were able to do this, you know, via special, some kind of special tooling built around the outside. Um, we also did benchmarks on this. Uh, I would refer you to, so, and, the, and the, 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 the punchline at the end of this is that, you know, after quite a lot of work for configuration here, um, we see that um, Podman can contain, uh, can perform comparatively or even better than Shifter when it's configured appropriately. Um, so I'll reference, there's a, an upcoming uh, paper called Scaling Podman on Perlmutter, Embracing a Community Supported Container Ecosystem. Uh, by Larry Steffi, uh, that's coming at the Canopy HPC uh, session in supercomputing. Um, so if you're interested in this work, you know, please reference that paper. So this looks like for Podman here, um, what this looks like, you know, our, our workflow for Podman, uh, again, is very similar to what we had before, but now we're all inside the, the HPC ecosystem the whole time and we can use Podman the whole time. Um, we no longer really need to do this ship step because we we started and ended it on Perlmutter. So our build step looks very similar, but instead um, we can use Podman. I forget to, I think I skipped over it in the last slide, but we also basically because of all this configuration step, we made a wrapper uh, that sort of automatically does that configuration for users um, to avoid missteps. So this is a, basically a super set of Podman commands um, that we are providing. Uh, so yeah, so when you see podman-hpc, that's what that means. So we can use podman here to just do a build as normal. And then when we come down to the run step, uh, it again looks very similar. Instead of, we don't have a pull because we didn't push up, but we have a an additional step here, which we call migrate. And then when we have, and then when we run down here, we have this uh, sub command called run shared. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in the following slide. And if I can have like 90 more seconds. <laughs> um, so the building here, there's not, not really too much remarkable. This is, this, this is the same process. Like I said, this migrate step um, is, is important to be able to create that efficient uh, file system mount. So what this does when I say migrate my image latest, how do I see migrate my image latest, is it takes the normal kind of Docker style or image and it creates a squashed a squashed read-only version of it that can be accessed efficiently and stores it elsewhere on the system. Um, shipping is exactly, is really the same. You can log into any registry, you can tag your images and you can push. So this is all very standard and there's no really um, remarks here, but there are some references to common registries you might use. Um, and so running, you know, this is this is kind of the interesting part here. So if I wanted to run an image just on uh, a login node, then I would have uh, this would look very much sort of like a normal container solution where I can do Podman HPC run my image latest. Uh, but if I want to do this in a in a in a batch context, or if I want to do this on a compute node, then I mentioned you know you might use this new you would probably want to use this new sub command called run shared. And what this does is it launches actually one container per node. And then one, and then many processes, one one process per task uh, inside the container. And we've determined this is kind of a more efficient way to scale uh, containerized workloads. So that's all packaged up in the subcommand. And then finally, 
if we go back to that issue of, of including, uh, you know, efficient uh, HPC libraries into your containers, we've also provided some hooks, uh, GPU or MPI, which can do that, uh, which can, can hook those libraries into your container when you launch it at runtime. So you just add those after your run shared command and you get that, that benefit. Okay, so that was a, a whirlwind to the end there. Um, the summary is, you know, Shifter is currently, is the current current solution that's available and it provides good container performance on Cori and Perlmutter. However, we have demonstrated that that Podman has very comparable performance and will provide many additional benefits. So if you're just getting started, we, we recommend you look into Podman and we will have a working Podman HPC wrapper coming very soon. Okay, uh, so thank you very much.